You don't know? Oh, you want to be known. You want to be famous. Well, then you should be a rock star. What do you want to do with your life? What's your life's purpose? Ah, see, you need to do some self self examination. What is it do you really want to do? Sometimes you just got to try a bunch of stuff until something hits you, and you say, Aha, yes, that's it. That's what I want to do. Okay, so we know her hands are, are clasped together over her knees, which means her other arm, which would be across from this arm here, is going to also come down to her thigh and go up and clasp. So that's where her other arm is, and we just can't see it. Drapery, there's a whole, and that's another thing that's so easy to study. You just take a piece of cloth and throw it on top of something, light it and draw it and study it and try to figure out what makes drapery look like drapery. And you'll see that it breaks down into very specific shapes. And you can use like the pattern in the tartan of her, whatever it is, shawl or whatever, to help define um, exterior contours that normally we wouldn't be able to define because there are no such things as lines in nature. So you can't really use, we're, when we draw with line, we're kind of lying. Lie, lying. Ha <laughs> ha, I made a joke. All right, so there's her hair. So that's that's going about the bad as good as all I'm going to get. So I also look at places, things like the shape in between things, like this negative shape here. This shape here, this, uh, let's see, I'm going to move her knee out a little bit more because the shape, this distance between her knee and her head, and her back is pretty straight. Okay, so that's the girl, and look, see right here is where her, you can just barely see the top of the line of the, so that's like the press it under glass sort of thing. So now I'm going to do the other guy. Up, 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 order, order. No. Okay. Crop this in a little bit more. too many other things going on on this page. I need to get rid of some things. Probably didn't leave enough room to really get her in there right, but where's the top of her head compared to the top of the deer? Barely, barely. And look, the shoulder lines up with her head perfectly. So when I draw animals, I tend to go with, the line of action is a little bit less accessible. I put her too close to the deer. Well, she's going to overlap. I'm going to move them closer together for our purposes here. Look, her ears, the ears are on line with the knee. She's going to be eating grass right next to her foot, even though they're really two feet apart. I'm going to move them close together. So then we have the shoulders, we have the belly, and it overlaps. The shoulders are in front of the belly, which is in front of the hips. Because what are the th ways of telling depth in a scene? Um, overlap, scale. Acuity, contrast, um, atmospheric perspective, you know, hue and value. Things get lighter and bluer as they get further away from you, and they also get more obscure because there's there's atmosphere between you and the things that you see. And also um, perspective. So you could say 
Well, this is our eye level here. We decided that the eye level was low. So his feet are almost all lined up on the same plane, on the same edge, which is lined up with his head. So that's where you were thinking like, oh, the deer's feet were back further, so they need to be up and higher. But the deer's feet are really all kind of clustered together, really close together, which makes it hard, harder, because you can't even see that back foot, really. Then I think about, then I think about the underlying bone structure, the anatomy structure, which is what makes anatomy so useful. These shapes here are the shoulder blades. And the shoulder blades on a four-legged creature stick up a little bit above its spine. And you can see, you could actually draw this as blocks too, because I think some of your drawings you were doing this, the deer head almost straight on side, but it's really a three-quarter side view. So if you have to draw everything in blocks, you could do that too, just to get the sense of, because here's one eye and here's the other eye, socket, you know, ridge, eye ridge. And their eyes are on the side because they're lunch. <laughs> they're other animals' lunch, so they have their eyes on the side. So this is in front, and then this is on top, and this is the scapula, and this is the other scapula, and there's the neck. So there's the, the humerus goes like this, the scapula goes like this, the humerus goes like this. And then this is actually like the forearm, and then what looks to be the knee is actually the wrist, the same thing as the wrist on our body. And here's the other one. They line up together here. And then their belly always bulges out because all their guts kind of hang in a sling in the rib cage. And her back leg. And then, so I'll definitely, when it gets really into crazy foreshortening like this, I really rely on those negative spaces. There's a tiny negative space here for the, between this and the farthest leg. There's a tiny negative space here between the two back legs. The hock of the hind leg is just underneath. So you could almost grit it. You could grit it out, which is what that guy was doing with the tiger that, that you were saying you wanted to use. What do you want to use the tiger for? Just drawing? Oh, for fur? Yeah, um, that's fine. We get a use a real get a picture of a real lion so that you're drawing from the real fur. Or, um, I mean, you can utilize that kind of in the background as an idea of how to lay it out. But when you're actually drawing the fur, you need to use either a real lion if you can, or a real cat. You can use a real cat or a real dog. So, how's Bambi's mother? There's quite a bit of space, oddly, between the front legs. Because they're, he's, she's sort of, if you looked at her from the top, she'd be kind of, the deer would be kind of going like a curve. You know, the head is turning over here, and here's the shoulders, here's the body, here's the back legs. So it's becoming more telescoped as it turns away. Ears are awesome. Ears are just like drapery. And they sit on the top side of the head. Now I think I need to make it even longer because, or I need to make the short legs shorter. Head needs to be, okay, the neck needs. So the just so yeah, I'm always talking to myself when I'm drawing too. So the distance, if you see something that's wrong, it's better just to go back and fix it than to try to paper over it. So the distance between here and here on my drawing is too short compared to what I'm seeing. Of course, the what you're seeing is also the camera is a distorting device, so you have to be a little bit conscious of that. And sometimes you'll draw stuff that isn't what the camera is showing you because you know for a fact that it's not like that. So. It's a pretty smooth line from the head to the lower part. That's a little better. 
and then the ears, I'm always looking for where they're overlapping, like where it overlaps the neck, the bottom part of the ear, and then this part of the ear is free of the neck. And then this part of the ear is a little taller, and it's still lining up with her knees pretty good. So that's, there's my sketch. And actually, I like bringing them a little bit closer together. So I'm making an artistic decision in retrospect to actually move the figures closer together. I don't want that big space between them. Does that help? Okay. So that, that was the whole trick with getting that creature into its proper position was almost... You could grid it, but then you also don't really learn how to see the shapes without the grid. Although it's not bad to start out that way and grid a few things until you get used to seeing the shapes. The negative shapes, if you make the negative, you can draw negative shapes much more accurately than you can ever draw the actual shape because the negative shapes have no real name. So that pesky little left brain that likes to get in there and tell you what to do can't say, well, I know what that is. That's a, uh, uh, it's not anything. It's a shape. So then your right brain goes, to, see, I can draw it because I'm looking at the real shape. I'm not looking at the, what you, your symbol of the shape is. I'm always having discussions with my brain that way. <sighs> Am I crazy? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I like it. I like being crazy. I have no problem with being crazy. Okay, so there's not a lot of light, like we, like I said before, as far as um, good cast shadows. We've got some cast here, and I'm going to have to make up her ankle, but I know the ankle bone is there, and a little bit of line where the calf is. It's really super low res, so like as far as using this as as a, a reference, you're only really going to be getting an impression from it, so a lot of it becomes more original because you're having to think of other ways to accomplish getting getting the stuff in. But still, I think working from really, oops, this is really too tall. Her shoulders are too tall. How about that? Because I'm, now I'm looking at this space here, and this space is a little smaller. And you can't really tell where her head is because she's got too much hair in the way. So we'll just have to go with our gut feeling. Tell them we're busy making art right now. <laughs> Tell your person in the background that we're busy making art right now. And then we can just barely see the backs of her legs right there. Okay, I like that a little bit better. Each time you revise it, you'll like it a little bit, hopefully, you'll like it a little bit better. So we've got a little shadow here, we've got a little shadow here. We are going to make those stripes really follow a sort of um, exterior contour. And it slopes down and then up and then jogs around these two little it would be really useful to take a piece of striped material and lay it across something and try to draw it realistically using those stripes as a guide to help you get the form of the drapery. So we put a little shadow in here. And then there's a light stripe here. So see how now it's kind of like forming around her body, giving more of a depth and a form and a sense of, of mass to it, three-dimensional mass. And I'm keeping the the outlines really loose because there are no outlines. We have to use 
line when we draw because drawing is a line-based art form. And if you're doing animation, of course, you're having to do it with line. But the thing that kills us, really kills the depth, is if your line has a hard outline. Like it cuts it out of the background. It cuts whatever your object is right out of the background. You can't, it doesn't, nothing, nothing is really separate from its environment. We're in our environment. We're in the air, right? The only difference, the reason, the reason that we have the skin is that the air, the skin has this membrane. Right, and the air stops when it hits the membrane. Some things just go pass right through it, and that's okay too. But it's not a line; it's not a hard line. It's just it's it's a transition from one material to another. So you could use it. right, yeah. One of the biggest things I think for you is to back off that outline. Um, especially in the preliminary stages. I mean, if, you, if you, in the end, if you want to make it a design and you have to use line, that's okay. But then, then you can manipulate the line so that it does things to make things seem more round. Like here is a line; it overlaps, and this line overlaps, and there's a shadow right here. And this line is a little darker on this side because it's more of a shadow side. There's no really what defines what defines the neck, which I'm going to put that leg too close to that. But what what is it that really defines the neck? The light behind it. So we make the neck a little darker than what's behind it. So in the same up here, what defines that side of the neck? It's the light area of the hills behind it. So I work from the edge in and bring the line into an edge because we want to get rid of here we have these look like two lines but they're really not it's really a shadow here and this is a round form so what defines this side of the round form um light actually the shadow from the hip is really what defines the outside edge of that belly it's not a line around the belly so much and we have a highlight here. So once you start seeing things in terms of their highlights, now what defines the back of the deer, the dark of the trees? So when you're ready, so keep that line really light and loose. And when you're ready to put in the tree background, but that tree, the background is not as black where the trees are as is the grass here. You can isolate it like a, with a little thing and look at individual parts of the, when you see it by itself, not in relationship to something else, you can see how the true color of it. So what defines between the legs? It's dark in here. So we can make that a dark shape. And we can make this a dark shape. And then this can be a dark shape. So there's a, there is a, an exercise you can do where you're only drawing the negative shapes, only the negative shapes, and since you can draw them more accurately because they have no name, then everything else has to fall into place. Everything else has to fit. So if something's not looking right, like with your the one deer you were having a problem with, where are we? Where's your other deer? Do I still have it open? Yes, here it is. No, oh, that's just the bones. Okay, here we go. Oh, now my computer's going to bog down on me again. Yeah, bugger. Uh, 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 it's on that page. This almost works. It's just that you don't see. Like, so this one here, it's... um. I forgot what I was going to say about it. This is better because this is overlapping more, but the space is here. You can't see those back feet, so don't draw them. That's the hardest part, is not drawing what you can't see. 
Because, oh, man, does that upset your left brain? Because your left brain is like, but wait, I know it's there. How can you tell me it's not there? I know it's there. Well, that's very good, but you don't see it, so we can't draw it. But sometimes you know something's there, and you need to draw it a little bit in order to pull off the illusion. And that's okay, too, but you're making that choice. You're not doing it because you can't not do it. You know, you can't, don't know how not to do it. You, you're making, artistically, you want to make your own choices in how, what's being shown and what's not. Now, sadly, we don't see the feet in the grass, but we really are going to need to draw the feet. So I'm going to have to find some feet, deer feet elsewhere in order to understand the structure of the deer feet, which is where studying the anatomy comes in handy. So here's the dark here, and here's dark here. On the front of the leg, it's dark within its surroundings. So we can put that dark in there. And then the hoof back here is darker than the leg. And then there's like a middle, a middle. This is a, it's, it's got confusing light, so that makes it even harder. So it's better if you can have a good solid light. But that's starting to kind of move a little bit. Maybe. I hope. Maybe we'll put the tree back in here. We'll put the tree in here. This can become very um this this can be more abstract because it's not an important part of the picture. You can pick and choose what's important to the picture as long as it's enough to make the picture work for you. So that hard line, I would get rid of that in the end. There's no hard line there. So in the final rendering, that hard line gets blended into an edge. And it's got varying shades of light and dark in there. And it can stay fairly loose, fairly obscure and abstract because you really don't see it. It's not in um, it's not in sharp focus, so don't let it take over your drawing. You're in control of the drawing. It's hard to not rush through some of these things that are less important. There's another idea that you need to spend as much time on the foreground as you do on the background, you need to give them the same amount of energy so that the image stays balanced. That makes sense when you think about it that way, right? So you don't want to draw everything in isolation. So you have to be patient even when you don't want to be patient. And it's hard because our our society, the, our, the schools, industry, everybody wants to quick, 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 quick. Get it done fast, fast, fast. So the more ground I have to cover, the softer the pencil I use, generally speaking. And I am not a landscape painter or artist because it just makes me crazy to do landscape. I've done only a few landscapes, and I don't feel like I'm very good at it because I don't have the patience. But it is still the same philosophy. It's an illusion. You're doing an illusion of what you see because you can't see each individual branch or tree. So I'm like looking for areas of light and dark, I'm trying to go with that. So there's our trees. And you can do a little bit of this stuff here like that when you're, it's not important, but you want to fill it, but you don't want it to overpower your drawing because we want to focus on this as being the most important part of the drawing here. Great big doe eyes. Oh, man, last year I hit a, do a deer with my car. Worst experience ever. Oh my god, the only thing I can remember is seeing its big brown eyes in my headlights and screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming. <laughs> I didn't put the on the right button. Yes, I totaled my car. I most certainly did. And I had to buy another car. And that sucks. Because now I have a car payment again. No. It bites. 
I liked my car. It was like 12 years old or 16 years old, and it worked great. I took great care of it. Didn't get the best gas mileage, but it wasn't bad. I'd never even had the clutch replaced on it. It had 150,000 miles, and it's a stick shift. It was a stick shift. But, oh, well. What can you do? So I'm still looking for areas of light and dark, even on the form of the head. I kind of squashed the head in a little bit, I think. Need to fill it out a bit here more. And then see how it transitions from being the dark part in front of the light part. This is stuff you probably should have learned in observational drawing. That's definitely the way that I teach observational drawing. This becomes the dark defining the light, lighter edge of the deer. So you can utilize this back and forth between foreground and background and modulate the tones and values to make an object fit in space and in its environment. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I like it. So what I would do then, if you want to stick with doing it traditionally, which is totally fine with me, because tablet is just another tool. It's not an end-all or be-all. It's not going to make or break you as an artist. Um, some people, I mean, when you're drawing, when, you're, when the apocalypse comes and, and all technology is destroyed, what's the good of a drawing, being able to draw on a tablet if you can't draw on a piece of paper? At least, at least I can take a, I know I could take a stick and burn it in a fire and make charcoal and then pound out a piece of hide or use a rock and still make a mark, you know? <laughs> Which is something you can't do on a computer if there's no electricity. So I'm a kind of a survivalist at heart. And survival of art is very important. I wanted to learn how to mix my own paints. I stretch my own canvas. But that's really a pain in the butt. I don't really enjoy that. But I can do it. No, it's just a lot. It takes a lot of hand strength. And um, probably if I couldn't get stretched canvas or get someone to stretch it for me, I would start painting on panels instead. So what I'm going to do is take some, I just found my tracing paper the other day. I like tracing paper because it allows you to, well, I've drawn on acetate too, it's not as easy to draw on as tracing paper. Or you can use a light table, but the paper that I drew on is a little heavy for a light table or a light pad. You can get light pads pretty cheap. In fact, if you have an iPad or something like that, you can use that as a makeshift light table. You can also use like a window in your house. Just tape your drawing to the window and put another sheet of paper on top of it. And that makes a nice... The problem with drawing on tracing paper is when you scan it, it gets it has a thickness to it, which leaves a little bit of a shadow, so it's not as clean of a scan. But I, this is the way I work up any kind of preparatory drawing for painting. Now I think I shall switch to, well, I shall definitely do a super light of an HB here, which I hardly ever use. And hopefully a deer in my book. It should be a stag. Yep, there it is. There's the stag. So I have. Notice there's seven vertebrae in the in the animal's neck because it's a mammal, and all animals have seven vertebrae in their neck. That's really cool is if you can get a little model of it. Now, the thing I don't like about this is that it's facing the wrong direction. So I'm 
I'm going to cheat because I can. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go even cheatier than that if I can find my phone. Kitty, stop it with your crying. You're making me crazy. Bagheera. No, he wants somebody to play with him. He's carrying his mouse around. He wants to play fetch. You want to you wanna play fetch? Come here. I'm going to take a picture of it. I could scan it. My scanner's over there, but it's not plugged in. So I'm going to do a photograph instead. No, not that one. This one. Here we go. So when you photograph your work, it's really important to have light on both sides. This is just in general. You want to evenly light it, both sides. Make it flat if you can. And square up. See, like here I'm squaring up the picture inside my camera so that so that the it's totally square. So that there's no distortion on the edges. That's super important. You don't want it to go like this. You know where you've got it at an angle, because then it's going to distort it, and you don't want it to go like that. So you've got to make sure that you get this totally screwed up. So if you can do that this way, that works. Otherwise, tape it to the wall. And it's got to be sure you're not ske skewing it this way either. I want to get my finger out of the way. And one other little trick that I should do is I can see through the page to the page behind it, although it's also printed on the back, which is a drag. So sometimes if you don't want to take things out of your sketchbook or something, you need to make sure that you put paper behind it so that it's not bleeding. So I'll take my picture and I send it to myself. Which is why I love my Mac. Come on, Mac. Come on. Come on, there we go. Now we see it. Accept. And Add another image. So this is this this whole thing with the, that I'm using with the OBS. You can actually set yourself up with OBS and use your cell phone as a um, webcam and set it up so that you can show me if you're having problems drawing something. You can show me how you're drawing, like how you're holding your paper or how your your setup, how your desk is set up. So if you ever want to do that, I do private meetings that way a lot. I like to see my cameras in there, right there. So I want an image. But there's um, it's a tutorial. It's in the uh, it's in the classroom. So you can always go check it out. OBS, OBS, Open Broadcast Software. Oh, there is my beer. There's my deer. So I need to shrink this buddy down a bit. So I would probably just scan it and flip it in Photoshop. Um, but I can flip it here, which is just about as good. Come on, in, smaller, smaller, there we go. That's not too bad of a... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can put it in a mirror in there if you want. And then we'll crop it down. Q. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love encyclopedias. Oh, yes. I used to see. Absolutely. I would sit there and read them. I would be supposed to be doing homework and I'd be reading it instead because I really love, I love learning. Okay, so I'm going to flip this. 180, no, horizontal. That makes it a little easier for me to deal with trying to do the anatomy of the deer. And I probably won't need the drawing down there as much. I don't need all this light on now. Too much. Okay. Huh? What? Oh, good. Oh, neat. Awesome. We found this really amazing dining room set, well, my partner did, in the trash yesterday, and it started to rain. And um, we managed to save it, and it's like at eight, like at one of those tables that expands out to seat 12, solid, thick wood that came from some, from New York City, like from 1900 something. And the guy was tossing it out, and he didn't have room for it anymore. And it was like, oh man. So we managed to stuff some of it in my car, and then we managed to. Uh, I found a broken chair in somebody else's trash, and we wheeled another big piece of it down. <laughs> down the street <laughs> it was awful but it's really cool and he we're learning how to do furniture restoration so he's cleaning it all up and it's going to be really nice okay so i can yeah <laughs> so this i can see the the scapula of the of the deer in the diagram but i know that the scapula on my deer is angled up a little bit more so now i have to kind of accommodate the angle of my animal to what I'm seeing as the bones of the creature. So I'm going to do it in pencil first, then I'm going to go over it in ink. So this is moving. A, now you have to keep your your mind into the idea of the perspective. Everything is in perspective because that's a side view, but this is a front view. So this bone, which is the humerus, is appears shorter. And you can see the top of it. And the what is the elbow of the animal sticks out behind it. So now this comes down to being really insanely clever about where you think. It's got two bones there, too. Well, let's see. The ulna. I always have to check on myself. The ulna is on the outside. But it doesn't look like it is on this drawing. But that doesn't mean that this drawing is accurate. But I'm going to put, so the elbow sticks out behind the humerus because the humerus is in front of it. And so then we do this ulna, comes down like this. And then the radius it doesn't really look like work like a radius, but we got to put it in there. It doesn't work the same as it does. And see all those little tiny bones in the knee? That's like what the wrist bones used to be. You don't have to get super, uh, you know, OCD about every single little tiny bone, but it's good to at least have an understanding that there they are. And then these bones in the front feet are what used to be toe bones that have now squashed together to become there. And then you can lift this up and take a look at it. See, there it is. Such a delicate little thing. Makes you wonder how they can run around. So this this part's pretty hard because it's the rib cage. So they don't have col collarbones either. So the the neck bone's going to come down here. And you can probably find lots of other versions of deer skulls that are at all kinds of angles. So it would be fairly easy to find a deer skull closer to the angle that you have it. But one thing that's consistent throughout all mammals is they'll have a zygomatic bone or a cheekbone around the eye socket. 
and then a little dent here above the temple. We have it too. I mean, you can feel your own face to find all the same bones. Um, the nose is, of course, mostly cartilage, so it's just a great big hole. And then it comes down to little tiny teeth with little tiny jaw, but this great big little tiny lower jaw in the front, but this great big masseter because they chew plants. And I like to do it as an overlay onto my original drawing because I want to see that the bones actually fit inside the drawing that I did. And if they don't, then I'm going to need to go back and fix it, find out what I did wrong with the drawing. So ideally, each layer, and that's the only good thing about using Photoshop, each layer should overlap so that things fit inside each other. That's ideal. Skulls are always so happy. They just smile all the time. <laughs> Who says that the dead aren't happy? So I'm not going to get into the whole spine thing, but as you can see, when it gets to this point at the neck, the seventh cervical vertebrae, it starts to have these long points on the top. Yeah, so you kind of have to figure. I think it would put in two lines. It would put one line in to set the spine, and then another line in to set the spines of the spine, because those are basically called spines too. And then the rib cage has got to fit within that cavity. So here's the rib cage, right? And here's the front. You can have the front rib here. And I might use three or four or five layers of tracing paper laying this out. And then when I get to the layer that get it to the point that I like it, then I'll do the ink. It's better than just erasing, 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 erasing. That's why I really like using the tracing paper and a light box. So here's the edge of the spine of the scapula. And then the, if I, if I had more reference, I would look at the front to see how the ribs tuck in, because I don't have that. I'm just going to assume that that's the breastbone and that the ribs fit into the side of it like this. And it probably goes like us, our breastbone, and it goes down halfway down the rib cage. So at some point it stops, and then the ribs just attach to each other. So, get to a certain point where, hopefully I can do it with this pen, a ballpoint pen. Then I can put in, and just trying to turn the object in my brain. I guess that's really, I've been doing it for such a long time that I don't really think a lot about it. But if you're not used to doing it, it's probably super hard to take a picture of an object or a drawing of an object and rotate it in your head. Tesla could do it, but I mean, he could do it with like his inventions, which is crazy, but kind of cool. Pardon? Tesla. Crazy scientist guy. He could imagine entire three-dimensional machines in his head and how they would work. And so lots of times he thought up really great things but never made them because he made them in his head then he didn't need to make them for reals. He was nuts. He also liked pigeons. Yeah. That's what I say too. Pigeons, rats with wings. So if you feel more comfortable drawing with the traditional material, definitely draw with the traditional material. If you have a scanner, that's even better because a scanner will be a lot easier to get the images flat and well lit. If you don't have a scanner, then use use whatever camera you have, put it flat on a flat surface and frame it up within that and then there's a couple of videos in the classroom where you can fix the color, um, strip out the yellow that you're going to get from using 
the camera in incandescent light. Try to get rid of that. Okay, that's good. And set the scanner to be like 300 DPI and then just reduce it in Photoshop. Yeah. And then you keep the scanner, you keep those images for your own reference, work from those images, and the lower imaged ones, the lower uh, resolution ones you can use to turn in. So you want to kind of, you want to try to give a little bit of volume and, and presence to the bone, but as long as it's clean, that's really what's most important, is that the bone be clean and as accurate as, as you can stand. But you probably need, I would get more than one reference, definitely, because I'd like to see how the ribs actually hook to the breastbone. I think with, with some land animals, their breastbones are almost like a, a vertical flat this way, whereas ours is a flat this way. So, yeah, it's like they're, they're, they're flat going this way so that the ribs come in and connect, because after all, they're hanging their organs in this cage from their suspended from their ribs from their spine and ours are in this like sitting in a bowl that are being held up by a diaphragm and kind of just protected by a cage so the, they have different different purposes for the same result no worries So does that does that help much? Okay, cool, excellent. See, I knew that I could just show you easier than even easier than doing a video and trying to explain it because I need I personally like the feedback from having the person I'm explaining things to tell me I do get that. No, I don't get that because if you don't get it, well, I'll explain it a little bit differently until you do get it because. Otherwise, it's it's wasted breath. So if there's anything that you're not understanding by how I'm saying it, you need to tell me so that I can try a different way. The only thing I'm not sure about the deer skull from this angle is how much of the how wide is the bottom jaw? Would we see light through it, or would it be a shadow because we're seeing the underside of the the inside of the jaw, or does it open in the middle? Like I know ours does, so it's probably see light through it. So I would want to find another angle of the jaw, just of the face, just to get that angle of the jaw in there. Both of my skulls don't have lower jaws. So I can't, yeah, both, both the skulls that I have don't have a jaw. And you, can, you don't have to draw every single tooth or every single toenail. You can be a little subtle about it because you really aren't going to see, unless you're doing an anatomical drawing, you know, for anatomy study. You can kind of hint at some of the more complex but minute attributes. Now there must be a dent in the forehead. I can't see it from the side view of the skull reference that I have, but I can see it in the actual animal. Pardon? No, I'm thinking here in the forehead. See the deer's eyes kind of go like that on the on the photo of the deer. So there. There must be a flat area here, which would be another good reason to get, you know, another angle on this on the nose because then the other eye socket appears to bulge out on that side. So that's cool. Then you gotta do the same thing with the human. You know, it's, but I I've been drawing humans so much I don't need to put in a sketch underneath. I know that Epicondyles. So this is what's great about doing 
this all the time is that pretty soon it becomes second nature to you and you don't have to look things up. So there's, I know that the elbow fits like that. Besides, I have a, a skeleton arm around here somewhere. And that the radius would be here and it curves a little bit. And that's what gives that forearm the distinctive shape it has. Then you have collarbone on one side and the clavicle, the acromion process on this side. Uh, sca scavicle, sca sca la 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 la. Scapula, the shallow joint that's formed by one side of the clavicle and the other side of the acromion process. And then there's a little scoop where the glenoid fossa is, where the arm bone fits into the scapula. And the scapulas are basic scapulae, scapulae are they have a spine on them on it too, just like this one has this spine right here. Ours has a little bitty spine right here. That's where a lot of the muscles attach to. And it's it's going to wrap around and pretty much disappear around the other side. And the spine goes in here. So I'm doing this a little faster than, than I would if I was trying to do a truly anatomical drawing. But the ribs angle down a little first, and then they curve up. And these last two ribs are floating ribs. And there is little spines on the back of our vertebrae, but they're a lot smaller. And the ribs change pretty significantly when they get from the bottom of the, this is called the thoracic spine where the, the um, no, the thoracic is where the ribs are. And then the cervical is where the head is. The cervical is the neck. And what a lot of people don't understand, or it's it's hard if you don't unless you think about it, that the way that the the head is is made, there's like an egg-shaped cranium, and then the face comes off like this, and the spine actually comes in here, right behind the jawbone. So from the front, you don't see these top three vertebrae. From the back, you do. Eyes are always in the middle of the head like so. And the nose is made of cartilage. And there's a little hollow in the cheek where the, here's the separation of the, see I can draw this without looking at reference now because I've been doing it for so long. And that's when it gets fun, is when you've got it memorized and it's just second nature. The only way that's going to happen is if you do it all the time. So you become an obsessive compulsive and then uh, live happily ever after. <laughs> so I could put the curve of the back of her skull because I know that it has like this occipital and you, sometimes you know it doesn't hurt to just feel your own bones and your own muscles if you're not quite sure what the diagram is showing you because it's all pretty similar the cheekbone would stick out like so and that blends in and then we wouldn't see the eye socket really because her head's turning away. And then under that would be the upper jaw and then the lower jaw. And that would, oh, see, this is hard. I would rather find a reference and do it. I like it accurate. So if I can't remember it precisely or I can't visualize it in my head, then I want to get reference so that I can get accurate. But there will be a bit of a, a dent down the back of the skull. Maybe we might see her eyebrow ridge. Okay. Do you want me to do a muscle one real quick? I'll do anything to keep from having to grade. I hate grading. But I was helping my students. I'm recording this too, so. Right? I'm working. I work all the time. <laughs> All right. Now, muscles. Let me look at your reference again. Do you have muscle references in here? Ooh, UPS guys here. Oh, 
Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So this again is flipped. We would have to. Well, we can flip it here. Um. How can I do that? Tools. Yeah, that's it. Tools page. Replace crop split. No, I want to rotate. No. Darn you. I don't want to rotate, rotate. Oh, here we go. I can do it. Nope, I can't. All right, never mind. I'm just going to copy it and paste it into a Photoshop file. I don't know, you know, do whatever you can, right? In fact, that the only advantage to using a computer is the creative ways you can cheat. <laughs> but in a good way. It's in a good way. It's all it's all about board. I'm not trying to do anything bad. I'm honest, I'm not. So a new file and paste it and then flip it. And then flatten it, layer, flatten, and save it as a JPEG. No, oh, not as a copy. I'm just gonna save it as a photo. Blah 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 blah. Talking to myself again. There we go. Okay. So I shall swap this guy out. For the one I just made. Oh, oh, that's right. I cropped it. I have to fix that. Eek! It's tiny. So turn off that. There we go. And flip it. All right, so it's not labeled, which makes it a little more exciting. I'm going to take the bones off from underneath. But I should be able to still pull it off. And actually, I'm going to use a colored pencil. So, because I've done a lot of the study, I know some of these muscles already. This long one here on the neck is the um, is our same as our uh, trapezius, and then the, there's a smaller one that's the same as our sternocleomastoid. So that's it's just longer because it is. Um, You know, the neck is longer. So it helps if you can get an anatomical reference that will at least give you an idea of what the muscle is, where it goes from, and where it goes to. That will help. So this one here, if you think about this muscle on your neck that you use to pull your head around, it's attached to the back of your skull. So I use a slightly different color. Is that a different color? No, I think those are the same. All right, I use pink. I like to use different colors for the muscles so that you can see where one starts and the other ends. You don't have to do it that way, but now this this muscle on the back of the neck is the trapezius, and since we're not we're seeing the spine of the animal comes down like this, so it makes sense that. Oh, 
Oh, just translating it is really difficult, but we've got this muscle, and there's two parts of it here. Trying to, it's attaching to the scapula. So you remember where the scapula was. So that's where this goes. It goes, yeah, it goes from the spine to the scapula and down the other side. We just see a little bit of it down the other side. Uh, let's see. Mm, not too much I can do about the head. There's the masseter, which is the jawbone. It, 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 it isn't drawn very well on here because it goes from the zygomatic arch, which is that cheekbone, to the underside of the skull. So even though you might draw some of this stuff, and if you can put like a... Uh, Everybody's got the obicularis oculi, which is the muscle that goes around the eye. And there's also the blah, 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 some kind of a nose muscle here. And so there's going to be two of them. We might see the other edge of it. So you have to be a little creative in just figuring out where stuff goes. So once you do all that, I would go back in with the black and show this overlaps, and then, then it tucks under here somewhere. But this is overlapping. So I, I like to put a little fiber, muscle fiber in there. And then, and then this is attaching along here. And there's a, there's a separation here yeah but turning the form from that in my head to the angle of the figure we're actually drawing that's probably the hardest part but you'll get to understand the muscles and always think about the relationship of what the muscle is to the human as well because there'll be similarities they're all the same muscles just uh slightly changed because of of evolution, evolutionary need. So you could, if you wanted to, even use the same. I know the trapezius here comes off the back of the skull here and down the back, down the front. It goes like this, and then it wheels around the shoulder blade here. And there's a big white area. The big white areas on the muscles are the tendon and stuff that attaches it to the um, the bone because the muscles don't attach directly to the bone on their own. They have to. The trapezius does, yeah. And then you know, the deltoid would be here, which goes, it's a three-part muscle. And you'll probably only see the back and the side because the front will be hidden. And it goes from the a chromium process, which is that part of the scapula right here. And that's what's nice about the pec book. You can look in the pec book and it tells you where it starts and where it ends, the origin and the insertion. And that gives you a clue as to where the force of the muscle is. So it originates around the top of the acromion process in the front, front side, back, a little bit along the clavicle and down the spine of the scapula. That's the whole three heads of the deltoid and it inserts into the muscle of the humerus so to insert into the muscle of the humerus it's got to go between the biceps which is comes off actually the bicep starts in the scapula and one head of, the, of it goes over the shoulder joint and the other head goes under but you can't really draw that because you can't see it we don't care about what we can't see but it emerges here and then inserts into the front of, of the arm so the Interestingly, the biceps, which you think of as your arm muscle, your upper arm muscle, it doesn't even attach to the humerus at all. It starts in the scapula and then attaches to the radius. And then we can put the triceps on here. The triceps is a three-headed muscle, and it's very distinctive because it has the three heads come together from underneath, and from the back of the scapula and from inside on the um, I think it comes from the humerus too. But then it turns flat here. Let's think of that horseshoe look on the back of the of the arm as it turns into a tendon and that tendon passes around underneath the 
elbow bone and attaches into the ulna. So this, you have a tendon that goes from the back of your, probably from the scapula, I'd have to look it up, down into your ulna. And this whole purpose is to pull the ulna closer to your upper arm, rather than it gets stuck there when it stops at the elbow. So it's, on, it's only pulling. It can only pull. It can't push. Oh, I lost my... Right. So that once you remember, you remember that anything can't... It can't pull. It can only push. Then things start to make a weirdly weird sense. So this would be... There'd be a diamond-shaped piece of white scap... Uh, fascia on the back of the trapezius. And then I like to put the little fibers like a texture as the light and dark of the of the muscles so that it has a sense of being attached to something. And then this comes like this and there's three parts to it or two that we can see and the biceps and then the triceps which has this little bit of of a horseshoe thing going on here, a long head, short head, and a medium head. That turns into, you can leave that white, but it's good to know that there's a transition from the muscle to that tendon. And, and that helps understand the rip, wrapping and interlacing and, and interjoining and folding and stuff that has to go on, which will help you when you have to actually move the body in into a different position or if you're trying to draw a body that you see. Places where the bone comes to the surface, like the bony landmarks, are, there's not going to be anything but white there where the, the tips of the bones are. There should be a bit of white right here, actually, which I won't be able to put on because it's too late, but like the be like a little bit of bone that'll show up right there. So there you go. Fun, fun, fun. All right. Very good. Now I have to go back and do real work. <laughs> anyway, I I hope that you enjoyed that. I enjoyed it. It makes me so happy to draw. <laughs> <laughs>